Welcome to Life Bus. I'm Matt. And I'm Sarah. And today we're chatting with Mark from the Netherlands. It's going to be a fun story. Welcome back to Life Burst. It's great to have you with us today as we unpack another story of someone just like you. And today we have uh, in the studio, Mark. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, pleasure. Uh, now, your story doesn't begin close by here in the Adelaide Hills, but uh, far, far away. Where did life start out for you? <laughs> yes, um, life started out at in a town called Groningen in the Netherlands for me. Okay, um, slower. <laughs> How you Groningen. Mm, okay. <laughs> yeah, that'll be a challenge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm going to try that. I'm going to try that. Okay, can you say it again? Please? Groningen. Groningen. Yeah, that's close enough. <laughs> yeah. That works for me. We'll just roll with that. <laughs> yeah, we'll yeah. just then we do better at home. <laughs> right. So, and what was what was that, that, that place like? What was that place like? Oh. Notice I didn't repeat. <laughs> 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 um, look, it's a, it's one of those European cities of a size that you don't really see here. So about 200,000 um, people living there. Um, university town. Um, and so I was born there and moved away to uh, a small rural village um, when I was five, I think. And then after high school, I came back to it to study. So and and, and lived there. So I lived there from Oh, no, my 19th to my 30th, thereabouts, perhaps a little bit later. Yeah. Okay. Now talk about this village then. Now you say village. Uh, what, how does a village there compare to a village here in... Very Australia? similar, very right. similar. About about two and a half to 3,000 people there. Um, I guess, obviously, infrastructure will be different because um, flat over there, very flat, which makes cycling... A great experience so that's mm -hmm. good um, um it also makes for perhaps less interesting scenery right <laughs> okay. okay what type of things did you get up to with your siblings if you had siblings oh, okay yeah so my brother and i were both into soccer as any dutch boy pretty much um so that was a big thing um we loved our BMX bikes. We're always building tracks where we shouldn't. <laughs> um, so that's not much different from what we see happening here. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, other than that, I suppose it was pretty smooth. Um, you know, school wasn't too hard um, until exam time. Um, Lots of coffee saw me through, um, and um, yeah, I picked up the guitar at some point when I was fifteen. Um, that probably got me, kept me out of a lot of trouble. Um, that said, at some point when my mum was going around the neighbourhood collecting money for a charity, she often got the question, "Is that your boy?" <laughs> We can hear him here. We often have to turn the TV up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. And that actually worked in my work to my benefit because um, that was enough of a of an argument to get myself a better amp uh -huh. that actually allowed for decent headphones. So, and then of course I never really used the headphones once I had the amp. <laughs> <laughs> but you knew you had an audience. You know? yeah, well, exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> People yeah. listening. Okay, tell us more about soccer because that is a really big thing. It is a big thing. Um, what what to say about that? Um, when I do go back, and it doesn't happen that often, and certainly not in the current COVID situation, um, but when I do go back, in hindsight, I'm always surprised with the quality and the layout of the facilities that even the smallest townships have over there. Um, you've got to remember, we don't have uh, that sort of competition with other sporting codes that we have here. So there's there's, there's no footy, there's no rugby to, to be worried about. Um, so I guess that, that, that's a big difference. So all of the, the dollars for the team ball sports go into 
soccer. Mm. Um, so that, that probably makes a big difference. And um, I suppose that it's been the main sport for far longer than, than what it has here. I mean, I'm currently the goalie for uh, the Handorf Reserves. Um, and I'm aware that Handorf has been around for about 40 years now. Right? So that would have started in the 70s, 80s. Mm -hmm. um, back home, the clubs would be probably about twice as old. Twice as old. So mm. um, there's been more of a history there. So it has been easier for those sports to be more prominent over there than it is here. Right. Yeah. Um, it, my soccer career has never been anything to really talk about because didn't get very far. I stopped when I was 15, um, but always enjoyed it and still do. So do you remember the first time that you played soccer or kicked a soccer ball or should we be calling it football yeah let's let's call it football okay, right. yes. cool. we'll call it because football. As, as, as a european um you'll have probably have heard me say this before sarah but um i believe that mother nature intended balls to be round mm -hmm. and any sport called football to be played with the foot <laughs> so yeah let's call it football okay, okay. Um, football it is football it is um what was your question again <laughs> do you remember the first time that you started playing football uh I would have been about six. Um, the biggest thing I think is that because it is the main sport mm -hmm. and because at the time, and we're talking early seventies, um, at the time, the way towns were laid out and, and, and traffic density and all of that mm -hmm. allowed us to just play outside every day. So that's what we did probably about every day after school and, and, probably during school in breaks as well, we'd be out there on a pitch with a ball at our feet. Um, and that's a big difference. What I, that's what I don't see uh, children and young people do here these days. Um, when they're involved in soccer, they play when they have training or matches, mm -hmm. but I don't really see them out there just kicking a ball about, mm -hmm. um, which doesn't help as much in terms of wanting to become good at it because mm. you, you just need that contact time and you don't get it as much here as we did back then. Yeah, yes. that's a fair comment. Um, are there other major differences that you now look back on and see between, um, say, Australian life grow for kids growing up and life back in the Netherlands? Well, there's yeah, there's, there, there are a few things, but mainly, I suppose, the fact that it's flat back home and we would literally ride our bike everywhere. Mm. It, it wasn't so much a lifestyle choice or a recreational choice. It was just another mode of transport. So um, when I was done with primary school, went to high school in uh, yet again a different town about, I don't know, about 15 kilom kilometres away. Um, so that was about 30-minute bike ride. You'd ride there and you'd ride back home after school. And it's just the, the, the most normal thing to do. Um, and you can do it because it's all flat. And you can do it because um, we've developed a, gen, a, a genuine understanding of how to share the road. Um, where we're all aware that, you know, cars cyclists, everyone uses the road, everyone has as much, as much right to use it, um, and you just look after each other. If you're on your bike and you hear a car coming, you go single file, car gets to pass, easy, no issues. Likewise, cars know that there'll be cyclists about who don't necessarily always follow all of the road rules, but they know that they are there, so you, you, you look out for them. It's sort of second nature. Mm. Um, so that made it really easy for me when I was, I don't know, would have been 12 probably, um, when I transitioned from primary school to high school, just on the bike, 15 Ks, and you, you just did it with a group of people, a um, group of students. Um, so that, that was a big, a big mm. difference. And I would have loved for my kids here to be able to do it. And I know for a fact that my youngest daughter would have loved and still would love 
to be able to do it, but you just can't do it. I, you know, I suppose with that sort of awareness of a need for cyclist safety, because that's grown from a spate of, uh, of incidents where children got themselves killed in accidents in the 60s, 70s, when cars started to become, you know, a, a staple part of yourself, your, of, your, of your traffic and your streetscapes. Um, at some point, the Netherlands made a very conscious decision to change all that, where they go, oh, hang on, our children need to be safe on the streets. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's when that whole mindset, that, that culture started to develop, um, but partly driven by infrastructure as well. So many roads, certainly not all of them, but many roads will have a dedicated bike lane separated from, uh, from the main road. Um, but even then, uh, if there's no, where, where there's no bike paths, People will still look yeah. out for each oh, other. Oh, it's fascinating. Yeah. It's a, a, a huge it's difference. Wild. Yeah. This is Life Bursts. Uh, you're with Matt and Sarah. We'll be back with more of Mark's story soon. This is Life Bursts with Matt and Sarah. We're chatting with Mark. I love riding my bike. Do you still ride your bike around here now you're in Australia? I do. Yes, I do. Um, got a bit of a shock when we first got here and I'd brought my, and I had an old road bike anyway which Mm -hmm. probably was too old and too heavy to begin with but you know bought it when i was a student um when i didn't have much money available Mm -hmm. and i'd I'd ridden a few longer rides on that one back home um where we have this tradition that's come over from skating actually ice skating um in a part of the country called friesland which is by the way where the frisian cows come from okay freeze freezeland um, um so they had a tradition there that when all the um all the canals and 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 and, and rivers and whatnot uh had frozen over mm-hmm. that they would ride uh, a race um along 11 cities or well they're probably all villages not townships not so much cities but it's called the 11 cities ride and bikes. and that, that was originally on ice skating but um we don't get good winters anymore not not like the way we used to do and so in the spring this is done on bikes as well um, and i've ridden that I've ridden that a couple of times so you, and that's is, about 200 k's how do you do that Bike on ice. Well, you don't ride on ice. You ride on the road, Sarah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't know whether you tried it. That was all, you know. It seemed like the type not, of person that would try right. that. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. Um, we'll have to talk about that some more at some point. Um, <laughs> no, you, you've never tried to ride your bike on frozen ice? Oh, I might have. <laughs> I, feel like I might have, but you won't get. He mentioned you, all those accidents back in yeah, the day. True, that's is, probably yeah, that's what they were. You, 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 don't, you don't get very far with no. that, no. Um, but yeah, um, so coming here, I quickly, um, early on, I got my bike out of the shed and had a ride and found out that that bike was really not set up for riding in the hills at all. Mm. Um, had to go to the lowest gear straight away and then you've got nowhere to go. Um, so that bike went back into the shed and stayed in there for a long time. Um, and only a couple of years ago, I, uh, I was in the position to buy a decent modern bike, much lighter. Um, and yeah, I've been riding again since. Um, road bike and last year, um, you know, just after the lockdowns, also got myself a, a mountain bike mm-hmm. for more leisurely rides, I suppose, with the family. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. Now, going back to your story, uh, you mentioned high school. How was yes. how was the school experience for you going through? Look, the way it's organised there, it's different. Okay. Um, the system is different. Um, we've got a couple of suppose siloed sort of schools where you've got a, a clear vet stream from early on then there's 
a general education stream and then there's uh, I suppose a pre-university stream and often they are separate schools mm -hmm. sometimes the general and the academic stream pre-academic streams are in the same building that does happen but generally the vet stream is separate so um because I was doing reasonably well in primary school, it was clear that I would either do the, the general education or the pre-university stream. Um, and so as a result, at school, I was never, never been in contact with doing woodwork or construction or, or baking or any of those sorts of things. It was all very, I suppose, theoretical. Um, whereas looking at my girls here, um, my oldest has just finished at Mount Barker High. My youngest is at Heathfield at the moment. Um, just looking at the curriculum, there's a there's a lot of elements there that I think that, oh, I would have liked to be able to do that. Um, but, you know, due to the way that it was all organised back there, didn't really have the option. Mm. So, and I guess there's pros and cons for both approaches. Um, another, I suppose, pro is that um, it also meant that I sort of in my, my, my forming teenage years I was very much uh, surrounded by very much the, the same sort of people um, thinking in a similar way whereas you know if you've got um, your students that are more vet oriented with that comes a different way of thinking um, so perhaps wasn't as much in contact with those guys mm -hmm. uh, as what certainly I see my daughters mm. be. So, um, yeah, there's yeah. a lot to say for both. Yeah. And did you have a sense of what you thought you'd like to do at the end of that <laughs> schooling? <laughs> no, and I still don't. <laughs> right, um, yeah. That's one of those things that, um, that I tell young people on a fairly regular basis Um you know, as a youth development officer, community development officer, youth and recreation for the Adelaide Hills Council. Um, when I speak to young people, I often say, look, it's okay not to know mm. what you want to be when you grow up. I don't know what I want to be when I grow up and I'm here, mm. uh, supposedly. Um, I think it's more important to be open to opportunities that come your way and be ready to grab them and make the most of it. Yeah. I think that's far more important than knowing what you want to be is what happens if you think you know what you want to be and then when you're it turns out to not be what you thought it was <laughs> mm. um yeah yeah Good, good observation. Very yeah. deep there. <laughs> there Mark. No, but i mean what do you do then all, right. all your life you've been prepared as, as people in school tell you to mm. you've been preparing and, and to become that and then it's not what you wanted. Uh, what do you do then? You have to rethink your whole path, your whole, I suppose, when you work towards it, you're building your, your, your sense of identity around that as well. And so when you get there and, and it's not what you want, then you've got to rethink all of what you've been doing and all that you think that you are. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, you know, it doesn't always work out that way. Mm. There, there's a lot of people that become what they want, what they think they want to become, and they're happy with that. So it works for them. Brilliant. But if it doesn't work, then you've got to be flexible. You've got to be able to improvise, I suppose. Mm. Uh, so did you take a further study path, or did yes, you? Yes, I did. Yeah. Uh, and 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 again, that because I didn't know what I wanted to be, um, or what I wanted to become. And that's that. That choice was, I, I suppose, al almost the ultimate non-choice, because um, I ended up going to university in Groningen, and, um, and yes, yeah. Groningen, um, and uh, <laughs> studying uh, international relations. So, because I was interested in law, but didn't wasn't convinced that I wanted to do law. Mm -hmm. I was interested in economics, but not enough to study economics. Uh, history, same sort of thing, languages, same sort of thing, and then I found international relations. I went, ah, oh, it's got a bit, a bit of all those things, and it allows me to not make a choice. 
Wonderful. Let's do it. (laughs) We're chatting with Mark and we're going to find out more about his story straight after this here on Life First with Matt and Sarah. You are with Life First with Matt, Sarah and with Mark today, who's our guest in the studio sharing his story in the Netherlands and now studying at university. How was that, that period like for you? Oh, that was, I suppose, a long and protracted affair. Um, my first year I studied English, English language and literature at the uni. Um, that was a relatively easy year. Um, and I figured, oh, if this is the level of, um, you know, the level of attainment that, I'm, that I need to have, then I should be all right. Uh, and then I went on to study uh, international relations in the second year, which was a completely different ball game. Mm. Um, and besides that, studies requiring a lot more work for me. Um, during that year, my mother also uh, was diagnosed with cancer, mm. um, and she went on to battle that for another year and a half. Um, ultimately. Uh, not winning that fight, sadly, um, which I suppose I sort of fled from all of that. I was still going to uni, but not really putting much in because I just wasn't interested. Mm. Um, so uh, music, band life became much more interesting for me at that point. Um so I was in a in a couple of bands for a few years, um, and at some point I uh, well, you know, at some point during your your studies, your, your life as a as a uni student, you have to start making some money to um, to be able to keep your life going as mm. well. So, um, besides being a student and a muso, I also became a barman for period of about five years um even less time to study (laughs) (laughs) Uh, i had a great life but it wasn't very healthy um and it wasn't overly productive um so at some point this was around 2000 i said to myself we can't continue this way it is really high time to focus on that studies get it done get that masters and move on um, so, yeah, at that point, I, uh, I probably was in about four bands at the time. And I put it all on ice for the time and uh, quit that job at the, in the bar, which was really a nightlife thing. You know, I'd start at 11 or 12 right through the night mm. to, I don't know, five, six in the morning, um, which really skews your... Mm-hmm. Your bio rhythm. Would, yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so, stop with that as well, and then uh, you know just got little odd jobs here and there, and and and, and focused on my studies. Um, in the meantime, I'd also met Priscilla, who was going to be my life partner. I didn't know it at the time, but here we are. Um, Mark knows what's questions coming. Uh, How did you meet each other? Oh dear. <laughs> um, I'm not going to let you get away with this. Uh, we met. Through, uh, through one of my regulars at the bar, really, okay. um, who had a friend who was a drummer and he knew that I was a guitarist. He's, he's an amazing drummer. You've got to play with him. And that drummer turned out to have a sister mm-hmm. called Priscilla. And um, so I met her at one of her brother's parties. And What um, did you think of her? <laughs> when you saw her for the first time? Oh, there was, there was an attraction. There was an attraction. It was, I later, later found out it was mutual, so that's okay. Um, and, yeah, a couple of years later we hooked up and there we are. Okay. <laughs> that... <laughs> you know where I want to go with this. No, no, I don't oh, know okay, where you want to okay. go with this. Well, that's really lovely. <laughs> There you go. Okay, so you, 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 oh, do you want to go somewhere? <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> All right. Well, good. It's good. We, we, we're just getting great tips from our guests about, you know, uh, how they how they 
dated and all those kinds of things. So. Oh, okay. And if, and if they were nice, you know, when they first saw them or how would oh, okay. happen oh, right, to get all right. there? Or? Yeah, so um, <laughs> for, uh, for a couple of years, Priscilla uh, was in a relationship with the guy who introduced me to her brother. Uh -huh. um, huh. And then at some point that came to an end and... Um, uh, oh, I don't. I don't really know. Um, he snatched her out. Well, I suppose so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 this was around the time that I had had a birthday, and um, I invited them along because this is this is also one of those things that are different here as compared to back home. Um, my birthday is in the is on the first of August, right? Mm -hmm. So back home. One of the handful of days that you could be reasonably sure that you could have a barbecue party. I always had barbecue parties on my birthday. August. August. Mm -hmm. So coming here, this is one of those times <laughs> of year that you can be very sure that you can't I have, have a, a barbecue. <laughs> yeah. The river might be frozen over. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 Break out the ice skates. Um, yes. But yeah, so... Um, yeah, that at that that guy at, at that uh, that birthday party, um, we sort of really hit it off. We found each other again and sort of went, oh, "I really like you." Mm. Yeah, nice. Such a special. Yeah, I know when people share those stories with us here on Life First. Okay, now you can ask the non. Yeah, well, you were still question. studying at the time, international yeah. relations, yeah. and in your masters. So, yeah. uh, how was the process of the masters for you? You'd, you'd you were disciplined now. You you wanted to get it done. You cleared out everything else. Yep. Uh, yeah. Well, um, at the time, I thought I was working hard to um, to finish it all up. You know, I had a part time job during the day and studying at night and all of that. And then at some point, um, Priscilla got pregnant, which can happen. Um, uh, but but once we found that out, I found that I was able to work far longer, deeper into the night, slaving away on my, what would ultimately become a hundred page graduation piece. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I think I really needed uh, to have that little person in my life to really speed things up and get things into perspective for me. So um, yeah, thanks to Arwen, uh, I actually managed to get it all done um and pretty soon after that we you know was priscilla was 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 working already but was looking for a new job and i was ready for jobs um we moved to a different part of the country um and yeah pretty soon again after that we started looking at at, at australia um 2005 we were over here for a holiday because Priscilla's family had always had uh, an interest in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, so we went over here. Um, I should probably say that um, her parents moved here uh, in 2004. And so in 05, we were here for a holiday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We started talking about, you know, uh, what, what we do. Could, what, would that be of interest at all? Um, it's, you know, independent from each other, we've always had, both have had an idea that we'd spend some time living abroad. I mean, for, you know, studying international relations, that mm. sort of comes mm. with, the, yeah. mm -hmm. with the territory. Mm -hmm. um, but then when we were here and we just fell in love with the hills and sort of went, how good would it be to bring up our daughter, probably daughters or kids? Um, we didn't know that at the time, but the second one was going to come. Um, <laughs> um how good would it be to raise them in the hills with this sort of lifestyle? And mm. um, so, yeah, we sort of went, okay, let's see if we can make it happen. And so, yeah, there's a the visa procedure took about a year and a half. Um, and in November 06. Good. We're going to get all break. Oh. We're going to find out whether they did come to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> that that first time. No, we never, no, no, we no, never got here. That first time, that first time that you're talking <laughs> oh, about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is Life Versus Matt and Sarah. I'll be back after this. <laughs>
This is Life Bus with Matt and Sarah. We're chatting with Mark. Some people might think you might have been accepted to come to Australia, but did you really go to Austria instead? <laughs> no, that never happened. It's okay. a myth. It's a myth. <laughs> also, I'm not from Netherlands. I'm from Denmark. <laughs> As people seem to think. <laughs> So, okay, what happened? <laughs> yeah, 2006, right? Yeah, yeah, 2006. November 2006, we um, we validated our visa and landed Adelaide Airport. Um, yay! Yay! Oh, yeah. I'd, initially, I'd hoped to be able to um, to get here uh, a couple of months earlier than that, just on the back of the World Championships of football. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> Thought you were going to say because the weather, it wouldn't be so hot. And Oh, no, no I didn't know that at the time. Oh, I, okay. I just figured it's Australia, it's all going to be hot Ignorance throughout the year. Yeah. Because yeah. okay. I don't, when we were here on a holiday, it was February, late February. Oh, okay. So midsummer, pretty much, mm. hottest time of the year. Um, so I assumed that that's, it would always be like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Little did I know. Yeah. <laughs> I reckon I've, I've never been as cold or felt as cold as I did in our first winter at Harndorf. Man, that was different. Um, probably because of the way homes are insulated mm. or not. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, at some point I was, I was outside just in a t-shirt and I was cold and found out that it was, I don't know, probably about 13, 15 <laughs> degrees at the time. I think this is ridiculous. Back home when it's 15 degrees, I'm not cold. Why am I cold here? Bizarre. Um, Different. So even after all your bike riding on, on icy rivers and things, as yes, we've learned, you yeah, are yep. still cold here. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd never felt as cold. I suppose, you know, home insulation mm. and uh, central heating in every, in every house. So when you're inside, it's nice and toasty and comfortable. When you're outside, when you go outside in winter, you know you're going outside into winter, so you dress for it. Yeah. Yeah. So did you start to have you second thoughts? No. No. No, no, okay. we haven't we haven't had any serious second mm. thoughts ever. I mean, you make you make your comparisons and you often sort of go, "Oh, did we make the right choice for our girls? What are they missing out on?" Mm -hmm. Family. Um bike riding, all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the experiences that we had when growing up, they've got different experiences for them. And we go, you know what? Yeah, they may not have those experiences, but they've got these experiences, which we've never had. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, it's just the consequence of the choice that you make. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. Now you put all this effort into study and your master's yeah. and then you've moved here. What, uh, did you find work right away or did you come here with a job lined up? No, I didn't come here with a job mm -hmm. lined up, no. Um, none of us, neither of us did. Mm -hmm. um, so we we and, and we and came here I don't know, for the lifestyle, mm. a, a sea change, if you will. Um, and What was so appealing about the lifestyle? It's what I'm always so fascinated in with people who come to Australia. We, look, we just, What's different? We just fell in love with the hills and okay. um, I suppose with the way that people interacted. I mean, back home, there's, what, 17 million people living in a country not a third the size of Victoria. Um, it's crowded. People are on top of each other, literally. Mm -hmm. um, and that brings a lot of stress, physical and mental. And mm -hmm. here you've got space around you. Plus, you've got the sunshine on your head, all that vitamin D. It cre so, and, and the space, the physical space that you have around you also creates mental space. So just that whole outlook on life that we encountered here that really appealed to us. And we sort of, you know, let's, let's see if we can do that. Mm. Yeah. Right, so, so that came, that. came for the lifestyle. Yeah, um, works not everything, but no. Uh, so we but, did. We didn't have anything lined up. Right. Um, you know, at, at some point back home, after we moved to a different part of the country, um, I got into a very similar sort of role there, working for local government in uh, youth policy, and also part of the role was being sort of an interim 
placeholder for uh, for the youth worker that they used to have. Um, and in that role, I opened and start, started and opened uh, a youth centre there for the young people in in the council. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't necessarily look to do a similar thing here, but then when this job became available, I sort of went, you know what, I might just put my head in the ring because I think I might have a shot at it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, having a, a young family here, we needed to find our feet. Um, and that also means financially. Because by that time that I got the I got the job, um, we I don't know, we would have been here just over half a year and getting towards the end of our savings. So it really needed to happen. Mm. Um, and thankfully it did. Um, and being in this sort of role, working for the Adelaide Hills Council, I'm convinced was, you know, uh, instrumental in us integrating into life here because, you know, so much about all of the events and things and programs that are on offer Mm-hmm. Um, and you seek it out, and yeah, that that's made it probably a lot easier. Um, but yeah, uh, like I said, I did I didn't set out to come here and and do that sort mm. of role. Um, we had a crazy idea of um, wanting to organise uh, cycling holidays, taking advantage of the um, the Mawson Trail and that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, coming here with not a huge lot of savings we sort of went we can't start that straight away let's find our feet first and along the way that that idea just sort of went uh, to the mm. bottom of the of the shelf no uh, no nah, that's probably not going to happen um and so yeah the first couple of months pretty soon after we uh after we we were here um i read an article on the front page of the courier uh where one of the local cherry growers was um, lamenting that the season was here, but the workers weren't here yet. I went, okay, good. I'll harass him until I get a job, Mm. Um, which is what I did. Um, I rang him and rang him and rang him silly that afternoon um, and caught up with him. And um, yeah, so three, probably about two, three weeks after we arrived and we stayed with Priscilla's parents for those for those three weeks. Three weeks after, we'd mm-hmm. uh, we'd found a rental at Handorf, and the day after we moved into the rental, I started my job picking cherries. In many ways, one of the best jobs that I ever had. You're mm-hmm. out. You're outside. Um, you're getting fit. You've got the most beautiful office you'll ever have. <laughs> um, just that, yeah, the, the pay doesn't quite. Um, match that 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 level of mm. satisfaction. Mm. So, um, but yeah, I managed to work for them uh, for probably about five six months, and then this job came, and um, yeah, yeah, so, li- life really started then. Right. Okay. <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, this is the job that you're doing now. Yeah, I'm still stuck in this job. Um, yeah. <laughs> some people might say that local government is like Hotel Cal- Hotel California. Um, can never leave. Mm-hmm. Um, look, it's it's been a fantastic role um, that offers me a lot of opportunity to try new programs and new things. As and and you know, between running programs that build connection and skills and all those sorts of things, sense of belonging um, for young people, help prevent them from disengaging through to working with levels of government and, and, and service providers to identify what's happening out there, what sort of gaps do we see, what sort of trends and issue, emerging issues do we see, and then finding a way to address them. Between those two sides, it keeps you grounded. The one side keeps the other side grounded. So our youth leadership program is a fantastic bunch of young people this year. Well, they have been in the past two years as well, but this year they're hitting it out of the park um, and all the feedback that I continuously get from the young people that I work with in, in that side sort of becomes a, a bit of a touchstone as to what I'm hearing on the other side. Um, mm. Yeah. Brilliant. This is Life Burst with Matt and Sarah. We'll be back to hear more of Mark's story straight after this.
On Life Burst, we are chatting to Mark uh, involved with young people in the, in the local council when you move to the Adelaide Hills. But what are some of the things that you've learned about young people over those years you've been in the role? We often hear negative things. Mm. Uh, what, what's been your perspective as you worked with particularly young leaders? Look, that's I guess that's one of the things that I liked about the Hills as well. Didn't know that at the time, but when I landed in, in the job, that uh, as compared to back home where certainly young people seem to be defined exclusively from a problem perspective, you know, they, they are a problem and they cause problems. Um, I found that with the community spirit that we have here, we, we also look at the other side of things a little bit easier than people back home do. So, um, and that's at looking at young people as, I suppose, a fat full of untapped potential. Um, and I certainly see them as, as a source of energy um, and an inspiration often. Um, but while you're right, that often young people really only get into the media when they've done stupid things. Um, that's probably more of a reflection of how media work and how I suppose the, the human mind works in terms of when it comes to newsworthy stuff rather than hearing about the good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So there is both a similarity and a difference there between here and back home. Um, what's not different, though, is the young people themselves. Um, there's young people that, um, you know, that interact well with the adult systems around them um, that are able to go through uh, through school uh, supported and, uh, and, and and getting good results at school and all of that and uh, being engaged with their local sports clubs and, and whatnot. And there's people for whom there are barriers to it that, you know, have more trouble getting through of all of that. Um, that's very similar mm -hmm. here and back home. Um, so there's this old quote that uh, is often that I often come across in in, in, in you know youth work and youth development, um, where uh, it's quoted that young people these days are layabouts and they're lazy and rude and disrespectful and things like that. And that's a quote that is I haven't verified it, but that is often attributed to Socrates. Right. So, in that sense, if that's if that's actually an an actual quote from him, then nothing new under the sun. Um, previous generations will always uh, have something to complain about how the next generation is different from the from their own, um, and that's just because I guess that's what humans do. Uh, mm -hmm. We like to change society to make it fit the way we think we want it to. And then when we do, we find something to complain about when the people that are growing up in that system that you've created react to that system. Whether they react against it or to it, doesn't matter. They'll have a different outlook as a result of you having changed that system or the generation before you having done that. So, um, mm. yeah. That's very interesting. Is it though? I, it is. Yeah, it actually general. really is. It is. No, I it agree. It is. It really is. It, it is. It's um, very interesting. And, and, and um, you often hear people complain about young people not doing anything and just sitting, uh, sitting in their room with their Xboxes and Playstations and all of that. But to an ex to a large extent, that is how we have shaped their life. You know, we're so risk averse. Um, telling them to stay inside because it's unsafe out there with all the cars and, and, and all that sort of stuff. We tend to bubble wrap them. Mm. And then when they're 18, we're yanking it off and go, okay, you're an adult now. Go and be independent and be a leader. That's not how it works. Mm. You've got to, you, you can't learn if, if you're not allowed to make mistakes. Mm. So, and that's one of those things that, that, that you see around you, that I hear from my daughters and what I hear from other young people, that there's such a pressure on them at school, particularly, to 
not fail. But, you know, um, not succeeding in something is not the same as failing. <laughs> You're failing if you don't succeed and try again and don't succeed and try again and don't succeed, you know. Yeah. But every time that you try something and then and, and you don't succeed, you learn. If you don't learn, that's when you're failing. But so we're putting a lot of pressure on, on young people. Um, and again, that goes back to what do you want to be when you grow up, what we talked about mm. earlier. Um, you just put a lot of pressure on people and they're often those that that are engaged in their community and in their uh, in their learning but don't yet know what they want to be when they grow up, they just feel that sort of pressure and they see or in, in their minds often mm -hmm. um, that not knowing what you want to be when you grow up is setting yourself up for failure. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're placing a lot of a lot of pressure on them this way. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and this realization uh, in, in, in a discussion at, at YAC, when we still had a YAC, a Youth Advisory Committee, mm -hmm. um, resulted in one of the projects, one of the programs that we uh, started to roll out from there every year. And we still do that. It's a, excuse me, it's a year 12 support program, um, really designed to, uh, to normalize the pressures of year 12 that they're feeling. Um, uh, so on the one hand, it sort of acknowledges that hey, yes, this is this is probably the the biggest challenge that you face today. Um, but look around you. Um, don't make it any bigger than it is. Don't make that pressure any bigger than it needs to be. Look around you and and have a look at all those adults around you. Chances are that they've done year twelve. So most of the people that do it will manage to do it. Mm. So. Yeah, don't make it any any bigger than it needs to be. Um, so that that project, that program, project program. Yeah, That's um, yeah. Um, Makes them really that program them. is consists of two two elements. One is a de-stress pack that is filled with some goodies to take them away from their studies in between tasks. Mm -hmm. um, so there's bubble wrap in there and, and, and uh, colouring in pages, uh, chocolates, tea, coffee, Milo, um, all those sorts of things, a stress ball, um, uh, as well as uh, uh, a bit of a study guide with some handy tips and tricks and also a page dedicated to other pathways into further education. You don't have to have an ATAR. There's other ways to do mm. it. Um, again, with that idea of don't stress about stressing, about not getting there, um, there's other ways. Um, and then the second part of that program uh, is roadside messaging with encouraging messages that, again, look to normalise the pressure of Year 12 for our Year 12s. At the same time, it's a reminder to the community that, hey, hang on, it's, yes, it is exam time. There'll be stressed teenagers about. Mm. Um, Let's look after them. And yeah, them well, exactly. Care for them and be there yeah. for them. We've Most of us, like you said, have been there before in, in our lives. And you've made some excellent points and already shared lots of advice. But in the final minute of the show, do you have one piece of advice that stands out to share with those today? Uh, yes. Um, wherever you are in life, you've got to make sure that you're enjoying yourself. Don't count on others to do it for you. Make things fun for yourself. Excellent. 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 Great advice. Excellent. Thank, Thank you so good. much, Mark, for the advice. Thank you, Thank you for sharing what you shared. And I'm sure there's lots of stories of yeah, no, how you, what me. you do currently is rewarding, but we'll have to save them for another time. But, uh, <laughs> Thank you for coming in and sharing a burst of your life with us. Sounds good. Thank you for having me. Thank you, it's Mark, been a pleasure. for being passionate about <laughs> young people. Mm. Seriously, because it's good to have people out there like you that care about us. So thank you, Mark, for that. This has been Life Burst, the wonderful Mark. You can catch up with us wherever you get your podcasts from and on YouTube and Facebook. Thanks so much for joining us. Life Bursts is hosted by Matthew Karat and Sarah Freeman with production by Reese Jarrett and Kay Hoshra Ozadigan. 
For more episodes of Life Bursts, go to rawcut.com.au. This is a Raw Cut production.